we are a great civilization, much bigger than the sum of our individual parts, whether countries or ethnicities or languages, of which we have a plethora. And defining this civilization are our rivers. We are a riverine defined civilization, which defines us across space and time. It also joins us strangely in the middle from everything from the stratosphere where our jet streams define our monsoon, right up to the coffee we just had, where every time you have a cup of coffee, you have taken 140 liters of embedded water called virtual water. Think of it. We have tried to define this and give a word to this continuum of cultures, of civilization, as the Himalaya Ganga. Ganga is a generic term. And Himalaya Ganga signifies the highland, lowland continuity, civilizational continuity, the continuum. Now, Ganga, we have enough Ram Gangas and Baad Gangas. And even in Sri Lanka, the Mahaveli is actually called the Mahaveli Ganga. It's a generic term. I work in the Mekong also on the panel of experts. And I was stunned and surprised to realize that the word Mekong is actually a Khmer, comes from the Sans, comes from Sanskrit and is a Khmer Apabramsha of thousand years where Mekong is actually Ma Ganga that became Me Hong Ha and the Anglo Saxons made it Mekong. I've always wondered where the word Ganges came from. We saw Colonel Reynolds' map of 1776 before. If you look at the original map, there's no mention of Ganga or Ganges. He calls it the Mongni River after Mongir. And my suspicion is that the first sergeant of Robert Clive, as he was coming up after the Battle of Plassey, came to this big river, couldn't cross it, didn't know what it was, and probably asked the first Panditji, you know, coming up from his bath in the Ganges, saying, what is this river? And the Panditji must have said, Gangaji. And by the time the sergeant reported back in his Scottish and Ang Anglo accent, all the way down to the writer's building in Calcutta, it came back and it probably Gangaji had become Ganges by then. I don't know. I'll leave it to the linguist to figure out and give me the answer. But the point is we need to go back and define and see how we are defined by our waters. Water is not a subject. It is the focal point of interaction of just about every subject taught in a university. Too miserably, we, had, we have let water be defined only by the civil engineering department or a bad economics department. Every department needs to come into it. From atmospheric physics, as I said, all the way down to Bhupen Hazarika. Everything is important in defining water and in the process defining what we are. I wish my good friend Suresh Prabhu was here today because he, I, and Nisar Memon, former minister of Pakistan, we were all part of what is called the Abu Dhabi Dialogue. It was an attempt to try to break out of this impasse of nothing happening for the 50, 60 last years on water, really significant new stuff coming. Of course, you know, we don't expect three of us to solve all the problems of the world. But one important thing did come out, that we understood that water is a wicked problem. A wicked problem is a problem that forgets solutions. You can't even define what the problem is. People don't agree. They have different definitions of what the problem is, which means the solutions they come up with are even more different automatically, logically. We understood that this can only be addressed by what we call uncomfortable knowledge. It is probably comfortable textbook knowledge that has got us in the mess that we are in today. And we need to get out of it by having more bold researchers coming forth with new research, generating uncomfortable knowledge, and forcing, goading, pressuring everyone to come up with new ideas and new solutions. I'm in the middle of a research right now with Wageningen University, Sikkim University, quite a few of us there. We are doing the research on Tista Tamur, Tista in Sikkim and West Bengal, and Tamur on the other side of the Kanchenjunga uh, in Nepal, a major tributary of the Kosi. In short, what our very preliminary research that just started a few years ago 
shows us is that when you have plural institutions, when you have institutions that are not only government, for heaven's sake, as a previous speaker said, you know, you cannot only expect the private sector to do things. You can't have private airlines or any private thing working when there is no market. Markets are, have been created, let us not forget, by strong governments, whether it is the weak Tories in, 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 in England that created the market or the Chinese Communist Party that has created a strong market after uh, Deng Xiaoping. You know, it is strong governments that can create markets. But when markets don't exist, for God's sake, we need governments to come in and help create that market. But if they stay too long, they start stagnating and rotting, and they should get out after they create a market. You know, this is the main lesson. But we also need civic movements and cooperatives and you know, all the bodies coming together do, to do their own cheerful solution finding work here. And we find out that when this happens and there is plural institutions that work on water, conflicts, yes, there are conflicts, but somehow the conflicts seem to get resolved much, much easier. It is only when we have one big institution, whether a foreign investor or a big government agency, that's the only institution in town, that all kinds of conflicts seem to fester and never get resolved. The other lesson that seems to come out is that when you have significant local investments in water, when local people have invested, the local villagers, the local district governments, local businessmen, again, it seems they manage to resolve conflicts at that level much easier than having a you know, Narmada tribunal that hasn't been able to sort anything out for the last, I don't know, 50 years. So these are big lessons for us that we have to do more bold research generating uncomfortable knowledge. I would like to close by addressing my last remarks to the backbenchers, our students and young researchers in the back. You know, guys, I envy you. What an exciting time to be in water research. All the way from atmospheric phys physics, as I said to Bhupan Hazarika, water is a very, very challenging subject. My only regret is I, was, I wish I was 30 years younger like you. Thank you very much. <laughs>